In this episode, I invite back to the show, Jordana Levine, to speak about her brand new book, Make You Happen. It is the third of her beautiful books. The first one, Make It Happen. The second one, Higher Love. And in this episode, we'll be exploring that little piece that your manifesting has been missing. The part that really makes a difference and is the key to having everything you want in your life. We're going to talk about what self-awareness really is and the questions that everyone should be asking themselves. This is an empowering episode packed with practical information. You're going to absolutely love it. Okay, let's go to the show. Well, welcome back to the show, Jordana. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you. It's so nice to be back. So I was just saying before we hit record, I can't believe you've written another book already. Yeah. (laughs) Make the trifecta. This is your third book. Yeah. So it's a trilogy now, which feels good because now that now that I've got three, I feel like I can put personal development books to the side and move on to some new projects. So yeah, it feels good to have the third one out. Oh, how exciting. I'm I'm gonna ask you about those new projects later. But firstly, uh you were already on the show not too long ago last year. Yeah, and we were speaking about higher love and manifestation and all of those wonderful topics. Yeah. How has life unfolded for you since I've last last spoke to you? Yeah, I'm not sure when we last spoke. When was it? It was like halfway through last year. Oh, almost a year ago now. Can you believe we're almost halfway through this year? I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, what has unfolded? Well, I guess I wrote this book in, in the midst of all of that. God, this all it all just feels like one long blur, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I can tell you, though, that throughout the past year while I was writing this new book, which is about self-awareness, I sort of had to rediscover who I was become self-aware again Mm. which was which was a fun experiment really yeah yeah really embodying everything that you've written about here okay so tell me how is this new book make you happen yeah different to the first two particularly the first one which was make it happen Yeah, yeah. Well, what Make You Happen is, it's really a follow-up to my first book, Make It Happen, which was all about manifestation. And it's sort of working on the premise that in order to manifest what you want, you you need to first acknowledge that you manifest who you are. And in order to do that, we need a really strong self-awareness practice. And self-awareness really is the basis of manifestation, but also the basis of everything that I wrote about and taught about in Higher Love. It's actually the basis of all personal development and self-help work. So I thought it was really important because there actually isn't a book out there about it that we all sort of really understand what the concept of self-awareness is and how we can become more self-aware. And you were pretty adamant, particularly in the opener of your book, that this is not a self-help book. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's not a self-help book in the way that classic self-help books are written. What it is, is a book that will guide you back to self. But I was just really conscious, and I've been like this with all of my books, of not being preachy to people, to not talking down to people from a pedestal. You know, I don't know any more than the rest of you know. I just, um, along the way, have had to sort of shine a light on my own stuff. And what I've discovered through that is what's being shared in all my books, but especially in this one. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned as well, sort of almost being unsure maybe if you'd have enough anecdotal life stories to share yeah. and then all of a sudden you found that you did in this one what was that like for you how did you kind of come up with more of those stories I mean we've all got an endless well of stories to tell and I think that's what makes us so self-aware is really reflecting on the experiences that we go through and that can be a day-to-day practice that can be a monthly practice maybe that's something you reflect on you know annually but we do all have a wealth 
of experience and personal stories that that we draw upon in order to sort of um, move towards our potential. Yeah, yeah. And including those throughout the book obviously helps really illustrate and put context to the teachings or the guidance in there. Yeah, I think it gives people something to relate to and especially when it is shared in uh you know like a really sort of personal and vulnerable way there's a lot of conversations that we don't have with each other let alone strangers and I think it's important um that certain stories are shared so that people don't feel alone that people feel like they're able to relate um I think there is a fine line with personal development work that you know it's being taught or shared from a place not of being fully healed from it or have learned all the lessons but from a place where you're not in the thick of it when you sort of have a little bit of perspective on the things that you've been through yeah Yeah, beautiful and do you mind sharing Jordana like just whatever comes first to mind or one of your favorites that you shared in the book and the concept it related to Yeah, I think um, there's some stories in the uh, identity chapter where we sort of like identify with who we are that I think will resonate with a lot of people. I kind of start off talking about all of the official ways, superficial ways, sorry, superficial ways that we identify. Um, And they're things like, you know, body image, um, fashion, um you know sometimes even our job titles like our career um something that we yeah attach to which is all fine like there's nothing wrong with attaching to any of those things as long as it's not the only way in which you identify yourself because if we look at job titles for example you know if you were to lose your job or unable to do your job for whatever reason that may be or perhaps you know um you become a parent and you have to step away from work we've got to be able to have factors that identify us that aren't attached to those external things so I tell a few stories around career and around um, some of the fashion choices I've made throughout my life and also some of the struggles I had with body image growing up and comparing myself and I'm not alone in this comparing myself with uh, other people Mm -hmm. Um, yeah you know I almost feel like body image struggles possibly like I interview a lot of women on this show and I'm it just occurred to me that I feel almost every interview every story has somewhere in there some kind of insecurity around our bodies isn't it crazy just how common it is Uh, absolutely and it's just been you know drilled into us from such a young age um, on a subliminal level really for for a lot of us um, that we don't yeah, I mean, it's hard, It's impossible to avoid. I think it's even harder these days. I, I could not handle being a teenager. I know, with yeah. social media. Yeah, yeah I just don't I, know how they do it. I think that too often. And um, it is so easy to identify or hold your identity and uh, identity? identity <laughs> <laughs> with what your body looks like. And yet our bodies are not fixed. They will change. And there's only so much control we have over that. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So let's come back to this idea for those who are just like, okay, she's talking about self-awareness, but like, what does that really mean, Jordana? Let's break that down for people. Yeah. I mean, look, it's not the sexiest topic to talk about, which (laughs) I was sort of like, how am I going to write a book about this? Because I think it's sexy. Thank you. (laughs) People will appreciate it. It is sexy because it is the foundation to all personal development work Um, and it is the key to manifestation, to landing, you know, what it is you really want to create in this life. Self-awareness really is about getting to know yourself Um, and when I say getting to know yourself, I mean having an awareness of your strengths, so what you're good at and what you love and what lights you up, but also having a really good awareness of what your weaknesses are and not so you can uh, use them as an excuse for why you don't do this or you'd never be able to do that or, you know, you're potentially stunted because of X, Y, Z, but so 
once you're aware of them, you're able to work with them. You're able to make changes when necessary. You're able to try other things in order to, you know, improve in an area or, you know, it's not even improvement. It's acceptance. It's like accepting something about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think when we have an acute sense of who we are, it means that we can show up better in our lives. It means we can understand how we're feeling about certain things. Um, Our communication improves we're able to recharge our energy and know um, our own energetic capacities and when we know our own energetic capacities then we can deal with mental health a lot easier we can manifest a lot easier Um, you know we we understand um, our productivity and all of those sorts of things so there's so many benefits from being more self-aware and I think the reason that there hasn't been a lot of um, work done around it in terms of books that have been written or even courses that have been done about it is like I said you know it's not the sexiest thing to have to sell in but it is the most beneficial yeah and I think there might be an element there of exploring what's usually the sexy part is talking about you are limitless and expansion and all these ideas of like, you can bring anything into your life, but there's a degree of exploring with self-awareness, your limitations in order to gain some benefit and insight, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Who would have thought limitations had some kind of benefit? Yeah, but I think that, and this this is personal development work. If you are ignoring the weaknesses, if you aren't looking into the shadows, if you want to pretend like the darkness isn't there, then there's only so much you can do in this lifetime. You know, like if we're all hanging out in the light and we're only focusing on the positive, we're missing out on all of this other juicy stuff. And that's where real growth, real expansion, real limitlessness comes from. Yeah, yeah, because when we understand the limits of our human selves, we can work with them, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What happens, Jordana, if we try to manifest from a place of not really knowing ourselves as well as we might want to or possibly could? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that there there again is like a limitation to what you could possibly manifest. When you know who you are, you are essentially changing your vibrational frequency. And when your vibrational frequency is um, really strengthened, then there's things in your life that are going to be naturally attracted to you. And this is where sort of the way that I talk about manifestation has shifted in the years since I wrote Make It Happen rather than a practice that you sit down to do in order to manifest something. We're sort of at a stage now where manifestation is just part of being who you are. And when you are constantly aligning with what it is in your life that feels good to you and you are constantly playing to your strengths and embracing your weaknesses, then you're just in a constant state of manifestation. And -hmm. everything that comes towards you or even the things that you miss out on, it's all sort of part of the bigger energetic plan. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. Okay. Okay. So part of this discussion then brings in the idea of authenticity. Yeah. What is authenticity, Jordana, in your understanding? Yeah, I mean, it's such a sort of convoluted term, but in my understanding, authenticity is being in alignment with the truth of who you are. And the only way to know the truth of who you are is to be (laughs) self-aware, understand who you are at your core, what lights you up, what you value, um, you know, who, who you are from the inside out rather than who you are from the outside in. Um, and and an, being your authentic self is allowing yourself to remain in alignment with that as you move through life. And of course, there are instances where we step out of our authenticity in order to fit in or in order to achieve something that we think is right for us. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's saying, Am I coming from an authentic place here? Is there is there room for me to move back into alignment with what I know is true for me? And the thing is, nobody's going to be able to tell you what's true for you. And this is why self awareness practice is so important because the only body, the only person who's going to be able to figure that out is you. Which I think is so important when people come and work with me or with anxiety. There's a lot of needing external validation 
yeah. needing outside people to say you're doing it right this is the right way to live life yeah. and a lot of second guessing and questioning because there is an assumption that we usually pick up somewhere in childhood that this is the right way to be and that's the wrong way to be there are right choices and wrong choices so knowing who you are and listening to yourself becomes very important when it comes to managing anxiety too. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So let's take that idea of authenticity a little bit further though, because I like to really pick out these, these concepts. It's easy to assume that the goal is to always be your authentic self. Do you find that to be true? Or are there times when it is okay to not be your authentic self fully? Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I, I would, I never want to tell someone what is right or wrong. And I am definitely not my authentic self a lot of the time. I think though, what you've got to ask yourself is, is this, is this something that I can uphold? What is the purpose of being out of my authentic self in this moment like what what purpose is it serving yeah. um and is it something I'm willing to continue with so for example if you were not being authentic within a relationship how sustainable is that yeah if you are not being authentic uh as the face of your business or your brand how is that going to serve you how's that going to serve you long term what's the point I love where you've taken that yeah yeah if you're being inauthentic to get through an uncomfortable conversation because it's easier just to do that than to pull someone up on something or it's not really worth your energy, do it. By all means, do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as long as you're not hurting someone else or, you know, being dishonest or you feel like your morals are intact, then by all means, get through the conversation. Um, but yeah, if it's a, if it's a long-term thing, you've got to ask what the impact is on you. Yeah. yeah, I guess I always think of it in the ter in terms of professionalism. You know, this idea of being professional, particularly in work. Like there are some moments where we are required potentially for the good of a project we're working on or getting something done um, to not disclose how we're really feeling. For example, if you or I woke up today and was feeling like, headachey and not so great or maybe you've had like a fight with a friend and then you have to get on and do this podcast interview is it inauthentic to uh you know not talk about that in this moment or to not share that no I don't think so I yeah. think I think we know when I think we know when it's okay to share something for the benefit of the project so this podcast interview for example or, you know, um, I mean, maybe if you were, say, in conversation with a friend and they had opened up to you about a situation and they said to you, have you ever had to deal with something like that before? And you lied through your teeth and said, absolutely. I don't understand what you're talking about. No, you know, but I can sympathize with you. Mm, I mean, I would say maybe that's being inauthentic. But but again, it's like you've got to have a look at the situation within itself. You know, if it's a one off thing, I think that's fine. If you're aware of who you are at the time and you feel like you're going to, you know, feel OK about it afterwards, then then that's fine. I, I like to give humans, you know, a little bit of leeway with things. I think yeah. I think we know when we're when we're doing something detrimental either to ourselves or to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. It's almost like, yeah, those moments where telling a white lie yeah. might have a, a benefit. It's so interesting. I'm glad you explored that with me because I just think it's it, like there, are, there would have been a number of times I've turned up to work with a client, for example. And when they say, how are you? My most authentic answer might be not the best today, but I put my stuff aside for the benefit of that connection and that moment with that person. Yeah, yeah. And that is being a professional. Yeah. 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 Okay. So shifting gears a little bit, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about 
how you've approached this book, Jordana, is be, is the part where you, because I can so relate being a self-help kind of addict or like loving listening to the latest podcasts. I obviously like to teach on these topics too and explore all of them and yeah, really have my own practices and things that I love to stick with. But you mentioned going cold turkey off the whole thing and just exploring what happens when you put all of that noise away yeah and turn inward and what was that like for you well I think the term I used in the book was I could finally hear my own fucking voice and I think you know I mean that f word with all of its profanity because I had gotten to a stage in my early 20s where I it was all external validation I was looking for in the personal development work. You know, I was seeing psychics, I was going to alternative therapies, which is apps, all of that is fine, except that I was doing it constantly without taking on anything that I was learning and nothing was enough for me. And I just wanted everyone else's validation that I was going to be fine, that everything was going to be fine, that I was a good person, you know, and um, once I just quit it all and I thought, okay, the only validation I'm going to seek is from myself, I could finally hear my own intuition, my own inner guidance, rather than constantly relying on other people to tell me what to do. And once I was able to do that and sort of start to self-reflect, I could see who I was and how I responded and reacted to certain situations. And um how I felt a situation should be played out and whether it was the right thing to do for me. And the only way we can get conscious of that and start to learn about the different ways that we can listen to our own internal validation and intuition is by practicing. Mm. Oh my mm. gosh. That's so, I love that you've, you've shone a light on that because it's just as easy to tick all the boxes in the self-development world and put your identity on that and I'm a good person because or I'm doing it right because I'm meditating every day because yeah, I'm yeah. saying this mantra because I've got this discipline or I do my three things of gratitude every day yeah as it is to get your validation from your career or the relationships in your life or whatever it may be the clothes you wear yeah. and it's another little sneaky way that our egos like to come in there isn't it absolutely yeah, yeah, amazing. And so what did that look like? Did you have to literally like delete your podcast apps and things like that? You know what? I actually think it was before podcasts existed. I'm trying to think. I don't know. It was so long ago. Um, yeah, I definitely went off Instagram for a while and I put all my crystals in the drawers, put all my smudge sticks away. Crystals in the smudge sticks? Yeah. Um, I think I left some crystals out, but I got rid of all the smudge sticks. They went in a drawer, um, didn't pull out any of my cards, um, stopped seeing, uh, you know, psychics and alternative therapists. And um, I just kind of was being a normal 20-year-old. And look, I guess the thing the, the other thing with this is I grew up very spiritual like it was at home all the time it was always around me so it was almost like when people are sort of in their 20s and they explore spirituality for the first time I was kind of exploring what it was like not to have it you know and and in, and I'm not saying that you know stopping all of those things was the best thing I ever did because none of them work and they're all unnecessary because they're not but what it allowed me to do when I didn't have any of them and I wasn't reading any more books trying to better myself constantly trying to better myself and just learned to really enjoy the person that I was what happened was I was able to decide which of those therapies and which of those books and which of those practices actually felt good and that I was doing to you know, either benefit me or to make me feel a certain way or what I was just doing because I thought I had to do it and it made me a spiritual person or it made me look like I was, you know, developing in some way. Yeah. I yeah. mean, on one hand, it's kind of cool that you grew up with all of that and it was so openly accepted. I grew up in an atheist household okay. where, I mean, I had a little bit of like my grandmother on my mum's side was into astrology and a little bit of like, there were some ghost stories and things in the family of, you know, weird things that happened, but yeah. mostly it was, no, that's all bullshit. So I was the one that like 
that was my rebellion was to go and explore these things. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Okay. So going back to the book, you speak a lot about curiosity that comes a lot into these concepts that you explore. Tell me why is curiosity so important? Well, in the book, I outline what the three steps of self-awareness are, and they are curiosity, acceptance, and embodiment. And the curiosity bit is basically what the whole book is. It's an invitation for people to get curious about who they are. And what that means is constantly questioning things, questioning the societal expectations that have been placed on you and whether you live your life according to a set of rules that somebody somewhere made back in the 20s, um, you know, and whether they actually apply to you. Getting curious about how a situation makes you feel or how a certain person makes you feel. Asking yourself, how did I handle that situation? Could I have done it differently? You know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's getting curious. It's asking questions. It's diving deeper into who you are. Because if we don't do that, if we don't have the self-reflection, then what's the point of living life? Like what's the point in going through experiences and making mistakes and learning lessons if we don't take the time to reflect on them? Yeah, so beautiful. And it is so important to question these things. I mean, I'll share that for myself, I've recently really been looking at the questions of what the ideal fulfilling life timeline looks like in my head for a woman, because I'm in my thirties, I'm single currently, and I really want to explore with a sense of neutrality, what the path ahead of me look like, because it is different to what 20 year old Georgie may have expected. Right. And as I ask these questions, with curiosity, I've realized just how much, let's use that beautiful word, fucking bullshit I've been conditioned with to believe that there's only a certain number of check boxes that would lead to a fulfilling life for me, such as having a family, getting married, having a partner, having children. And it's so ingrained into us. And it was only when I stopped to question it and ask myself, well, is that really the only way I could live a happy life? Or could I also equally live a very happy, fulfilling life come what may? And that's been a really revolutionary, eye-opening thing for me to explore. And you can only explore these things when they come up, like when they're in your life and you're going through it. Yeah. I mean, that particular conversation is a conversation I've had a lot lately with a lot of different girlfriends in their 30s. Um, I think, you know, it's such an old adage that we were taught you know many 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 moons ago about how a woman's life is meant to look and if we don't question it along the way then yeah it is easy just to go along with what's expected of us we don't even realize it's an external expectation so yeah that's a really good example yeah um what are some of the things that you found yourself asking with curiosity um in that way Jordana if you don't I mean (laughs) I have always been super curious ever since I was a child, like asking why about absolutely everything is just ingrained in me. Um, Curiosity doesn't always come easily to everybody. And that's why I've really walked people through it in this book. Mm -hmm. Um, But I question everything constantly. I'm constantly questioning everything. I I question, you know, um, myself. Like I, I do ask the questions, how are you feeling about this situation? Is there a way that you could have done this differently? What have we learned? What are we going to do going forward? What's your action step this week? Like all of those things. Um, And then like on a bigger scale, yeah. I mean, I'm falling into the same category as you. I'm in my late thirties now, um, also recently single and, you know, really sort of starting to question what is it that makes me happy? And if the things that I thought I was going to have at this point in my life don't come into fruition in the time that I thought they would am I still able to be happy without them and that's a big thing I've been questioning lately and I think it's important that we do I think a lot of the time with stuff like that we get scared to 
contemplate it too deeply in case what we find there is scary or yeah. you know it's it's we don't we don't find the outcome that we were hoping for or or the feeling that we were hoping we were going to find once we dug a little bit deeper but if we don't do the excavating it's still there anyway it's just below the surface and what about the fear that you may then manifest it because you're exploring the shadow side because you're exploring the what I don't want yeah, I think it's important with manifestation. Like uh, there, there is a lot of talk about that. You know, you don't want to focus your thoughts too much on the things you don't want to create. I think that's bullshit. Like, I think that's utter bullshit. I think if you're wallowing in thoughts that you don't want to create and things you don't want to create in your life and you believe that, you know, you're not deserving of more or worthy of more, then yeah, you might, you might manifest that. But if you get to this point of excavation and digging and say, okay, well, this is how I feel and this is what would make me happy. And if it doesn't turn out the way that I expected that I'm okay with that, but, you know, or something better, whatever's in my highest interest, you know, whatever's meant for me will come for me. Like that's how we get around that shadow work, I think. And being open to whatever <laughs> comes your way. I think is a really beautiful way to approach it because I suppose where I've found the how to be okay with all of that, no matter how my life turns out, no matter what comes my way is firstly acknowledging we're always going to get some, some good shit and some bad shit. And that is, that is life. And in the book, we talk about the law of polarity in terms of like strengths and weaknesses, but in order to have a whole, in order to have a whole life, you have to have both. And that's the light and the shadow as well. You know, that is what makes us a whole human. So yeah. And no matter your bag, you are going to get some tough things or you're going to have something. It's like that thing about you can have it all, but not at the same time. Do you, how do you feel about that phrase? I don't agree with that. That cool. kept me trapped for a really long time. I used to tell myself I can't have a career and have a relationship because I'd never been able to have two at the same. I'd never been able to have both of them at the same time. So that became a narrative in my head. Mm. You know, you can either have the relationship and not be doing very well in your career, or you can be writing lots of books and be really successful, but you know, you're going to struggle with relationships. And that's the narrative that was playing out in my life. So I told myself that it was true. I mean, I just cannot continue to live a life like that because I'm not satisfied with those two outcomes, you know? So um, that's a new belief system that I'm trying to yeah. hardwire. Amazing. So. Yeah, so, so good. I suppose where I get that sense of okayness is from understanding that it doesn't matter what what bag I'm given. I'll always find a reason to feel bad about some things and good about other things and mm. the the challenge of life is to find a place within and this self-awareness work is so important where you acknowledge that you know you can find a way to be okay no matter what the circumstances are yeah you know there's always a way to feel gratitude for what you do have you were never given nothing and only bad stuff it just doesn't work that way mm -hmm. and you can have the things you think you want and still be unhappy about other things and it's just always going to be that process because I think that's that is how we keep desiring new and evolving and growing yeah that's so true yeah where do you find that sense of certainty within yourself or a place of safety no matter what is going on in that outside world um I mean I d have not aced that at all that's okay <laughs> I don't think any of us have um yeah I mean I struggle with that constantly uh, one of my biggest most important desires is safety um and I do struggle to feel that constantly. It is a lifelong practice for me, like knowing I'm physically safe, knowing I'm financially safe, knowing I'm safe in all aspects and still, still feeling unsafe yeah. Um, is, yeah, is something that is a constant practice for me. So I actually don't know if I have the answer to that. That's okay. That's all good. 
Are there any certain practices that bring you back to some kind of a, a safety, a centeredness within? Yeah, I think w- when I don't feel safe, I know that I'm in a place of fear. And I do know that the anecdote, the antidote to fear is faith. So I do try and slip into this feeling of trust, into this feeling, okay, what is secure? What can I hold on to right now? Am I safe in this moment? Always 100% I am safe in the moment. Um, I also, you know, I come back to like really simple practices like deep breathing, um, you know, going outside for a walk in nature is a big one for me, watching the sunrise, watching the sunset, all those really simple practices that really essentially bring you back to cyclical energy you know seeing that there is ups and downs to everything including the feelings of trust and faith and and the feeling of safety within your own life I honestly think one of the most liberating things a a healer friend slash mentor of mine told me was this concept of it's it's normal to doubt And that's in going into the doubt, it will strengthen our faith. There's actually a a metaphor around um, in India, they, they, when they dye cloth, they put the the cloth into the dye and then take it out into the sun to dry. And each time you put it into the dye and take it out of the sun to dry, it strengthens the dye in the cloth. And that is a natural, normal process of building our sense of faith and trust. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, it helps, right? Because it's like when we go into the Tao, we think we're back at square one and you're just not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so another element that you discuss in the book, and I'm very interested about this because I think it's very easy and you did talk about getting that external validation from psychics, for example, telling you everything's going to be okay. And I think that's so tempting when you are managing anxiety and you just want someone to tell you it's all going to be okay you're going to get everything you want it'll all be fine um what is the difference between healthy spirituality and that unhealthy spirituality that you discuss I think that healthy spirituality adds to your sense of self healthy spirituality brings you back to self guides you back to you If you are leaning again on that which is external to you in order to satisfy something or validate you in some capacity, then you've got to question what the point of the practice is. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, for some people, it is really leaning into the woo-woo side of spirituality. And I'm not going to take that away from anybody because I think that there is so much gold in that for the right type of person. For me, my spirituality practices over the years have become super simple and it really is just about, again, self-reflection, spending time with self. And yeah, sometimes that means pulling a card. Sometimes that means sitting in meditation. Sometimes that means, you know, working with crystals. But a lot of the time, it's really just connecting to the truth of what I know and not only recognizing it, but following it. I think with our intuition, a lot of the time we're like, oh yeah, you know, intuitively I feel this and then you don't do anything about it or you ignore it or you listen to someone else, you know, and go against what you thought. That's yeah. that's not an in- intuition practice, you know, and a, a strong intuitive practice is listening to your intuition and then following it. Yeah. So I, so I'm happy to hear the crystals came back out of the drawer. (laughs) Yeah. They're (laughs) everywhere around the house. I just, I mean, I think crystals are magnificent. I just found myself at different stages in my life, you know, desperately clutching onto a rose quartz, trying to bring in a soulmate or, you know, piling, you know, my desk with citrine in order to bring in wealth. And, and, and I think that there's nothing wrong with that, but there is also a lot of actionable steps we can take in our lives to create the things that we're trying to lean on crystals to do, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I just think crystals are so beautiful to look at. And if it, if you can look at a rose quartz and be reminded to feel feelings of love, then it's working. Yes. Like, I don't actually care if there's really this energetic frequency. I don't know if that's actually being measured. Who knows? Who cares? If it makes you feel those feelings, great. And also that's they're so beautiful. Great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why I don't want to take any of these practices away from people because, 
you know, the legitimacy of them to you is what's important. And, and I'm not taking any, I'm not saying that they're illegitimate at all, but whatever they do to add to your self-awareness practice and your connection with spirit and your higher self is all that matters. I think we all need a place to go when we are in that place of, you know, something in us is breaking apart, particularly maybe a big chunk of our ego is dying, such as I'm thinking about the last breakup I went through. It was the first time I'd actually ever got all my crystals, put them on my body just to just in the hope that that would do something. And I didn't care if it was just the soothing of the weight on me. Yeah. It was just the fact that I had chosen to do something to bring comfort to myself or if the crystals themselves were doing something. It didn't matter. It's kind of like that idea. We we all pray in the end, like when we're in that state. And look, you know, the the believing in something, the faith in something is what's important. I had this woman um, go through a course that I ran earlier this year, which was about marrying manifestation and self-awareness. And she'd grown up in a really Christian household, like deep, deep, deep faith in God. And um, she's, she's less inclined these days. She's not at church every Sunday, but you know, she's still got quite a deep connection with who she calls God, who I would call the universe. It doesn't matter who we're calling. Anyway, she can manifest like this. She has got no issue in manifestation because what she asks for, what she tries to create, she just asks God for, she believes wholeheartedly. She has complete faith that it will come to her. And it always, always, always does. She hasn't got one manifestation she hasn't been able to make come true. What she does struggle with is holding it once it arrives because, you know, there's a set of limiting beliefs that she's not worthy or whatever it might be. But it does really show, what she really showed me is that the faith and the trust in order to call things in is so important. So again, if your means to get that trust and get that faith is through certain spiritual practices that feel resonant to you, then that is all that matters. Mm. And I'm just thinking as you share that story, how amazing it is how faith compounds because now you believe in her as well. Not that we want external validation, but now you're adding to that force, that momentum. You believe in her. Now I'm believing in her. I'm like, wow, this girl really can manifest anything. Everyone listening is believing in this woman and it's only making it stronger. And we do the opposite with the doubt too. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, we have these limiting beliefs that aren't necessarily ours. Again, a society's like things that they just say over and over again. Like if you think about, you know, being single in your thirties, you're like all the, all the good men are taken, you know, all of those things tropes that we hear like again and again and again and again we start to believe you know so it's like okay well let's sort of flip the lid on that and what can we sort of start to believe in that's actually going to serve us in some way yeah yeah love it okay so as a reader journeys through make you happen yeah from the beginning to the end what is your hope in terms of the outcome where that journey will lead for that reader by the end of the book? Well, if you do the work along the way, which I encourage everyone to do with this book, there's exercises throughout the book, then by the time you get to the end, you will be very self-aware. The bad news is self-awareness is a lifelong practice. So you can't just sort of do it once and think that you're a self-aware person. But it does arm you with all the tools that you need to really figure out who you are. And then it's pretty much maintenance and just checking in with yourself constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, you know, while I was writing this book, I did have a complete unraveling of my own identity. And I did have to go through the book pretty much after I'd written it and rediscover who I was. Um, And in doing that, I sort of got to the end and it was fun. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Like these are all these new strengths I have now. And oh, maybe I sort of gained a few more weaknesses, but I can work with them now in different ways. You know, they add to my story. Oh, you know, now that I've been through this experience, I communicate differently. And, you know, I'm more respectful of my energy in this way or whatever it might be. So, you know, it's a really fun exploration into who you are. And, and once you finish the book, you really have good insight into what your potential is in all areas of your life. 
Mm, amazing. Yeah. And it sounds like it's something that, yeah, you don't just work through once. You go back to it because life's going to continue to challenge you and yeah. make you grow. And that sense of self changes and evolves. Yes. Yes. And if your sense of self is not changing and evolving, you know, you sort of got to ask yourself what experiences you're actually allowing yourself to have. Mm. Yeah. And Such. inviting that growth in. Such a good point. And when you mentioned like the bad news of that ongoing self-awareness, how boring if it was like, oh, it's just like me. This is who I am. This is just who I am. I'm just, yeah. this, this is the, yeah, person who I am. This is all that I do and this is what I like and it never changes. It's like, that's part of the excitement of life that it changes. Right. right. And I want to get people excited because I understand, you know, like when I wrote Make It Happen, it's got this like fast kind of snappy formula for manifesting. And when I wrote Higher Love, it's like, oh, here are some fun tools, you know, to go out and meet someone and whatever it might be. This one is still really fun. Like it's a fun book, but again, it's, it's actually creating a foundation mm -hmm. for all the other self-development, self-help stuff that you're going to do within your life. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you are able to take things a bit deeper with this one in a way. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. So Jordana, Firstly, where can everyone find your wonderful book? Uh, everywhere. If, um, if you're in Australia, it should be everywhere in all the bookstores. Um, if you are international, at the moment, the best place to purchase it would be um, on the website Book Depository. They ship for free worldwide, which is really cool. Ooh. Um, it's also on Audible if you prefer listening to an audio book. Uh, you can get the Kindle from Amazon. Yeah. Wow. So you've already recorded the whole Audible as well? Yeah, we did that a while ago. That That is such an experience, listening to yourself read your own book. How yeah. long did it actually take you to record you reading the whole book? Like I know obviously there'll be a certain number of hours of the recording, but in, in terms of days, weeks. So it's an eight-hour book, like as it's final it's eight hours it took us probably about 20 20 hours 20 hours over several days I mean we were I was recording it with a friend up here I'm, I'm lucky I've got a friend who's a music producer um, up in Byron and it was we were also recording in the middle of the Byron Bay floods which I'm sure everybody knows about so it's like you know, there was just so much sort of going on at the time and also the rain, like we couldn't record when it was raining because we could hear the, the sound of the rain. So it took us a lot longer than the average person, I would say. Yeah. Hey, wow. Oh my gosh. I'm glad we got that little part of the story. That's interesting. <laughs> and Jordana, if people are just wanting to know where you are and where they can learn more about you, where do you <laughs> hang out? Um, I hang out on Instagram, uh, Jordana Levine. I am playing around with the idea of hanging out on TikTok because <laughs> I have been spending most of my time on TikTok and I've kind of felt this real kind of resistance to Instagram all of a sudden. I'm not sure why. And I'm not sure what my life would look like on TikTok, but I do sort of feel that's where we're moving to um, from, from a social media perspective. So who knows? You might find me there soon enough. Fabulous. Well, I'll make sure that all of those links are in the show notes so people can find you nice and easily and grab their hands on Make You Happen. I've got my copy right here. Jordana, thank you so much for being here. It's been amazing to chat with you. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me on the show again. I appreciate it. So wonderful. Can't wait to have you again. Is there going to be, oh, before you go, yes. what are these new projects that are maybe little seedlings of ideas? Can you give us a hint? Yeah, I'm writing my first uh, fiction book at the moment. So um, it will not be personal development. It is a story. It is a fiction. And um, it's been really tricky, but I just... I just don't have any more nonfiction in me, you know, when you sort of reach the end of something. So I was really glad that I was able to do a trilogy, that I had three books in that, that genre. Um, yeah, and now I'm moving on to fiction. 
Fantastic. Yeah. I can't wait to hear the updates about that one. Your fourth book, which will be a completely different, amazing surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Now I'll let you go. Thanks so okay. much, Jordana. <laughs> if you're ready for the deep dive into this work to master your anxious mind, I invite you to join the Anxiety Reset Program. Over 90 days, I'll be guiding you on how to build your mental resilience, reprogram those limiting beliefs that keep you stuck in self-doubt, heal your gut, balance your hormones, nourish your mind, body, and soul. Using a combined approach of naturopathy, nutrition, hypnotherapy, and live group coaching with me, you'll feel supported and motivated to show up for yourself consistently day after day. And this is how you will experience extraordinary results. You can master your anxious mind. The best time to begin is right now. Let's do it together. You'll find the link to learn more in the show notes. Thank you for listening. We have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoy this podcast and you find it helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe or share this episode on your Instagram stories and make sure you tag at Georgie the naturopath. But that is all for today. Please be kind to yourselves. Know that you are enough and you are exactly where you need to be.